Hi, everybody. Um, it's funny to be on this side of the, of the, the whole thing. Um, and thank you, Graham, for inviting me to give a talk here on my work and for your support, and Fran for that lovely introduction. That was very nice. Um, I thought I would start this talk by showing you some very recent paintings. Um, uh, three years ago, I made a big shift in my work. Some of you have seen the painting that was in the 40 year celebration exhibition. Oh, now we start. Oops, it is, you know, it's good job. This is not the first painting that I wanted to shift this space for. It should come on now. This is a, um, a painting that will, here it comes slowly that was in the, the 40 year celebration exhibition that was here at the studio school a few years ago. And this painting was, um, can anybody see it? It's getting there, okay. It was from um, a last group of landscape images that I made. And after um, I came to an end to those paintings, I began a group of large figure paintings. And this was about four years ago. It took me a while to settle into this work and figure out what I was going to do with these figure paintings. And for a long time, I didn't show them to anybody because they, were, they just felt too raw. I needed to paint them without anybody's input. The work shifted again about a year and a half ago when I began to make paintings of my children and moved away from more sort of iconic mythological figure images. And these are a few of the very recent ones. So you get a, a sense of what I'm doing now. I'm not going to really talk about these at this moment. I'll talk about them more later. I'll just show them to you now. These are, the first one was 45 by 90, um, and this one is 60 by 90. So it's quite large. And this one is 45 by 90. I always think it's interesting to hear um, about why somebody decides to become an artist, so I'm going to give you some of my own story. When I went to college, I had already planned to study art history. I chose Smith College because I liked the art museum, and there was a very good art history department. I was strangely directed at that, at that age, and I'd had a very good high school drawing teacher who had us drawing from the figure and looking at old master works. Seeing um, an exhibition at the Metropolitan at that time, I was very inspired by um, the, uh, it was a, the Vatican show that came to the Metropolitan. And there was a painting of Caravaggio's Descent from the Cross, which sort of changed how I thought about painting. It was haunting and beautiful, and the figures entered my space and became part of my world as I looked at it. Their suffering was so human and so close. I don't have an image of that one right now, but I think maybe all of you know it. I never considered studying fine art in college. My parents impressed upon me that I had to um, be very practical and go and get a job after school. That I was able to persuade them that art history was somehow practical still seems like a minor miracle to me. Northern European art was my area of interest, and I'm going to show you a few slides of um, some of the things that I studied when I was in art history. Roger van der Weyden was one of my um, sort of favorites at the time. Um, but early Renaissance Northern European art from, from, you know, from the early Renaissance to Vermeer was what I was studying. I'm going to show you a bunch of these. So here's um, Roger van der Weyden, beautiful one of St. Luke and the Virgin. One of the things I really loved about these paintings was the, the figures and the figure in the landscape and the interior and the views to the landscape out and the kind of the world, the sort of complete world that you see in these paintings. Um, very beautiful. So this is what I was studying in college. This is Robert Campan. And one of the things I loved about his paintings too was I love the interior, exterior view. And something that still inspires me about his paintings is how everything just kind of comes right up to the picture plane. How this fire screen behind the Madonna's head comes up and presses against her head. How her hand presses against her breast the way the baby is folded into the space, the intense compression, and then the, the view into the distant space. This still excites me looking at that today. This is another Roger van der Weyden. 
and there's something so lovely about the intertwining of the, the two figures. And I really love to look at the hands holding the baby, that beautiful gesture of the baby's hand to the toe and the other baby's hand to the chin. They really feel like one form in this space. And this is memling of um, just some guy. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not gonna give you the details. <laughs> But he looks like a cool guy. <laughs> and there's a virgin. Um, just the placement of that little apple and strange gaze. Such an incredible rhythm through the space and the paintings, too. That's another memory, I think. This is a um, strange painter, Joachim Potnier, that um, I really. I loved in college and then I loved again later when I was painting on my own, sort of found some books on him and read a lot about him. But he's, um, this is sort of the real worldview kind of landscape where you get to see the whole worldview and you feel like you're up in the sky looking. This is, um, you know, somebody crossing the river Styx. So, beautiful painting. There's another one by Potnier. This is Saint Jerome in the Wilderness. But it's just that sort of wonderful moment in the, begin in the foreground and then everything going back into the space and then coming back up again. It's very exciting. That's another Potnier. So I think you'll see, oh, this is a Van Goyen. Um, in the Smith College Museum, there's a fantastic Van Goyen, which I used to look at all the time, but just the, the way you can feel your way through the space and the bigness of the sky, I think it's really inspiring. The way everything in front becomes just part of this big dark mass. This is a de Hoek. And um, this one is in Cleveland, so um, I was in Cleveland for a while, so I spent a lot of time looking at this. But I love the two spaces, the things going on, and. Um, the two spaces, and also her gesture, how she kind of beckons you into the picture. This is a Bruegel, a peasant dance. Wonderful energy. And another Bruegel. That's such a beautiful, quiet image with that painting. I love the birds up in the trees, taking flight. This is a Adrian von Ostad, who's a strange painter that you run into. And uh, uh, there's a fantastic painting in the National Gallery and one in the Louvre, too. They're so beautiful because they're so quiet and there's this dark space, but you look into the painting and then all these strange things are going on. I, I find them very exciting. The one, I think it's the one in the National Gallery where um, there's, it's, a, it's a schoolhouse and the schoolmaster is beating one of the kids. It's a fantastic painting. I really like it. But, you know. It's, you think it's very sweet, and then all of a sudden you realize, no, it's not sweet at all. It's really disturbing. So this is a painting. Um, uh, sorry? I continued to draw in college, but um, avoided the fine art department because I didn't really like the student work that I saw coming out of art classes. And in my last year, I decided to take a fine art class to complete my major. I chose a professor who was brand new to the art department, and he happened to be Stanley Lewis. When I started Stanley Lewis's drawing class, he asked me right away to come right into his, his painting class. It was called a color class, but it was essentially painting, and he dragged us outside and painted in the landscape every day. It was great. I realized I wasn't fated to be an art historian, and I needed to paint, and so I, I changed my life and started painting. Um, Stanley was teaching that summer at the New York Studio School, and I managed to scrape up the money to come here. It was in 1987, and Bruce Gagne was the dean. Rob Storr and Fred Thurs gave critiques, and I was warned at the time by Stanley to watch out for myself because, as he said, people might say they like your work, but what they really like is you. So, oh dear, <laughs> young college student coming to the city. But it was a fantastic summer. And after that summer, I went to Cleveland and ended up getting a job in the Cleveland Museum of Art. It was an amazing experience. I painted in my apartment, and then I got a small studio. And working in the museum was a real art education. 
I had several different jobs there, but the last one was the preparator, where I matted and framed uh, the newly growing photography collection and restored old master frames. As part of the conservation department, I was able to see paintings in the conservation lab being worked on by the conservators and got to hear some great stories of you know, who painted what and so on and so forth. What part had the conservator painted? What part had the, the actual artist painted? Um, and browsing the galleries was actually one of the most fun things. For one hour each morning, we dusted paintings with scu and sculptures with air guns and sable brushes. So that was a great experience. But after a while, I needed to, to, to sort of have more and to paint more. So I came back to the studio school in 1989 and I landed right into the drawing marathon with Graham Nixon. I had no idea what I was getting into, but it was a fantastic experience. Um, as you all know, the studio school education is unparalleled. And I studied with everyone who was here at the time. Um, for painting, I had Ruth Miller, Graham Nixon, Andrew Forge, Rosemary Beck, Joe Santori. And for drawing, again with Graham and Mercedes, Kajori and Rosemary. And critiques with Glenn Goldberg and John Walker and Jake Berteau. <coughs> Excuse me for coughing. This is a picture that was done at the school. It was in my third year here. Some people think it looks like a self-portrait, but it's actually my mm. studio neighbor, David Cerizier, who posed for me. He was very proud to have his portrait painted, and we brought people in all the time to look at it in progress. It's 8 by 10, so it's a big painting. He's sort of life-size down there at the bottom. And that's the development studio, if um, you guys can recognize it. Later on, I did this um, painting, which was a transcription from the flooding of Marcius. It's like it's pretty big; it's 90 by 90. But it was a great experience, and I always enjoyed doing transcriptions at the school because um, it, it taught so much about form and structure. When I left the studio school, I found a studio on 14th Street in the Meatpacking area. Back then, it was still considered dangerous there. Um, I was warned about you know, men with knives and things like that. The studio was dark and quiet and cold and lovely. It actually was an old meat locker and the brick building, it was a brick building the back of a main building with um, kind of iron bar railings on the ceiling to hang carcasses and a drain at the, in the floor. So that's where they stored meat, that's where I painted. But it had a wonderful skylight. And um, this is, um, I'll get to that. Here I worked through everything I learned at the studio school. I painted still lives, interiors, portraits of friends, and still um, self-portraits, and struggled to find something that felt right. I did a lot of drawing and painting from Greek sculpture, and this is one of them. And then I began to work from my imagination on figure paintings. That's one of them. This is um, about six by eight, I think, or six by seven. The idea that I had was that I didn't want to really paint I didn't really want to paint a model. I wanted to paint a figure that was more active. And I'd use my studio surroundings. This was the interior of my studio. Uh, or I'd invent kind of interiors or landscape spaces. At this point, um, I scrounged together enough money to travel to Denmark and paint in the landscape. I felt the need to connect with the landscape in Denmark and to see it again as an artist and explore it. I had traveled as a child to visit my grandparents there since I was a baby and played with my Danish cousins and stayed with my aunts and uncles while my parents traveled. It was a strange and mysterious part of my childhood which ended abruptly when I was 13 and my grandfather died. We didn't go back again and I didn't in, until my trip to Europe in college when I was trying to be a good art history student visiting Dutch and Flemish paintings. So this is um, an ink drawing of um, in, in Fleda, which is an, an area in Morris, and I'll tell you a little bit about that place. I stayed with my cousin in Copenhagen in that trip, and then I went north to Jutland, where my aunt and uncle lived on an island in the middle of a large fjord called Limfjord. My uncle and aunt, Steen and Kirsten, were completely inspiring to be around. They're both artists. Kirsten is a landscape photographer, and Steen makes sculpture. He paints, and he's an architect. They live in a farmhouse overlooking the fjord, in an amazing island filled with fields and farms and ancient burial mounds, stony beaches and chalk cliffs. It was wonderful to paint with them because they know every aspect of the landscape around Moors, or the fjord landscape as Kirsten calls it. When you see it, it's unmistakable. The land shifts and turns in great masses of water, like, like great masses of water on the sea. 
when you're just a little bit high, you can see from miles around and you really feel like you're in the sky. So this is a drawing from Fleather, which is on Morse, a little area on Morse, where I, I went back and back to paint. My uncle is a sort of amateur archaeologist, and he knows where all the Stone Age, Iron Age, and Bronze Age settlements lived and where they summered. He would take me to one spot and sometimes we'd go to paint and then we would end up instead walking hours on end, staring at the ground looking for Stone Age tools. It's amazing how your eye can adjust to scanning and searching for a particular shape or form. My best find was an early Stone Age bluefin axe. Um, it was terribly exciting to find this thing that was dropped thousands of years before by a hunter or a fisherman getting out of his or her boat which spent all those years rolling around in the sand just to be found by me on that day. So here's some drawings. This is another drawing of Flather. It's an um, ink drawing. These are some paintings. This is quite small. This is maybe, you know, um, 9 by 12 or something. You can see by the thumbprint in the corner. That little lump on the top is a, is a burial mound. And that's just a, a hill that looks like a ham. <laughs> that's another. So these are all small paintings. These are dunes. It's another one of Fleather. And another. It's dunes. This actually is a drawing from Italy. I went in 98 to Italy. Nick Caroni arranged for me to have a, um, a residency at his school. And I, I drew there and painted there. I rented a car and traveled around and, and painted. Italy was very different from uh, Denmark and what I was used to. It was a shock to my system. The, the shadows were so black and the the lights were these intense earth yellows and reds. But it was inspiring. It's a thunderstorm. I tried to find something that was more like I was used to, painting a storm and made it more um, exciting in a way. This is from the top of the World Trade Center. I was there in 96 and 97. And when I was up there, I was very interested in, in capturing the moment um, as I was painting and just really grasping what the light was like and the conditions up there at the moment. Because up there, it was you could just see the weather move across the city and the light changing changed everything. You know, you know, a cloud would go by and half the city would be black and then half of it would be light. And it was very exciting. So I, I really. Rather than doing a lot of long, extended paintings, I really tried to focus on doing ones that captured those moments because they were so amazing. And this, one thing that was exciting about being up there too was that it, it was like one of those Pottenier Worldview landscape paintings. It was an aptly named program, at least in the beginning. Um, I think later on it, they sort of turned their back towards the view, but um, for us in the beginning, it was very exciting to paint that. It's another one from up there. Another. That's the view from the south. It's um, the harbor, Governor's Island. And then also back there, Staten Island. This is a painting from um, Chatham. I went up and did some paintings and. Um, Olana and at Lois Dixon's house, uh, which was such a beautiful spot. It really reminded me so much of Denmark, so it was very exciting to paint there. This is from Olana, which is another kind of worldview, landscape view, where you're up on a hill looking down over the valley. <coughs> That's from Lois's again. Okay. Um, I just showed you kind of four years worth of painting in, in the landscape, but um, 
Now I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a process that I started after my first trip to Denmark. Um, when I returned to my studio in New York after that first trip, I began to draw with pastel. And I can't quite remember why I started with the pastel. I think I just felt like you know, they were there in my studio and I didn't know what to do, so I started drawing with them. And um, I got so excited about it and it was just quickly became a, an obsession. And I went out to the store and bought more and more pastel. And um, I began to test different kinds of papers that took the pastels in different ways and um, some soft ones, rougher ones, different shaded ones. And I loved to stand in front of those Sennelier drawers and just choose a palette. It was really exciting to think differently about color instead of mixing it, putting it together and choosing the colors rather than putting them, you know, with paint. I tried to stay away from the toxic ones because as I worked, I would drum up this huge cloud of dust and cough and hack and uh, it, it got to be scary after a while. So I, I went towards colors that I didn't normally use. Um, let's see, where was I now? I'm gonna show you a couple more pastels. That's another one. These are quite small. They're, they're you know, this kind of size. But some of them got big. In the beginning, they were small because I was just trying to figuring out how to do it. And then later, they got bigger. This is, these are from the first year of coming back from the landscape. And I, I have, and this is another one. And this might be the second year, a little bit bigger. Um, I was trying to conjure up my experience from Morse in the fjord landscape, which had been so powerful. Um, this one's a little bit larger. It's more like that. I wanted to draw from draw up the, the experience from memory, not how it looked, because the paintings that I did in the space took care of that, but really how it felt and the mystery of the place. When the dust cloud cleared and I exhausted myself with pastel, I turned to paint. The pastel had freed me up to think about color in a different way and to think too anew about the application of paint. I enjoy particularly working up big masses of color against smaller moments, dots and dashes and lines in color. By probing my memory, I was able to find a more imaginative, plastic way of working. Let's see, this one more. This one is a later one. This is, they got quite big toward the end. So now I began a cycle of work, painting and drawing in the landscape, and then returning to the studio and using the information gleaned to inform a group of drawings and paintings from my imagination. The experience of working from my imagination made me more adventurous and more directed when I approached the landscape and working in the landscape fed and gave depth to the paintings from the imagination. This way of working continued for several years. And as I worked this way, the paintings sort of came together more. In the beginning, they were really, well, I'll show you what you can see. The, the, the paintings that I did from life and the paintings in my studio, this one is quite large. They, they almost look like the work of two different artists. So these are paintings that I, and this is a sort of middle size, kind of 40 by 40 something painting. Um, sort of taking up what, in, in paint where the pastels left off. This one's smaller, maybe um, 18 by 30, 20 by 30. And this one is about, um, I think it's three feet high. What happened was that sometimes things emerged out of just working from my imagination that really felt like the places that I'd been in Denmark. This one really reminded me of a cliff where I had pa painted in, in the fjord. And I thought that was very exciting. But it was a different kind of, um, it felt like the place, but it was not something I could ever have made standing there in the space painting it. So that was new. There's another one. <coughs> And this is a big one again. This is from a different year. I had a great experience when um, the last year I was in Denmark, after I had the show there, we, we went to Bornholm, which is an island in the middle of the Baltic. And it's a, it was, had been Swedish island and then it was a Danish island. And, but it was, because of its situation, it was a great spot for, um, you know, seafaring people. So from ages back, you know, Vikings and everybody else was there and as a stopover from when they're going from Denmark to make their raids or whatever they were doing. 
So there are great rock carvings and Viking graves there, but also the water was amazing. And when I came back, I really was interested in trying to capture the feeling of the water and um, being in the water and swimming in the water. So a lot of these are very watery. That one really felt like going home. And the water was sort of brackish and, and black, just pure black. And there were rocks all around, little coves that you could swim in. And there was a Danish painter that I found when I was there, uh, a born home painter really, Olaf Hust, who was very, um, I found his work to be really inspiring. He's really, his, I've never seen anything in America. I've only seen it on born home and maybe one other Danish museum, but his color was amazing. I think he's maybe one of the most inspiring Danish painters I've, I've seen, but he's sort of mid 20th century artist. That's another one. And another. Some of these are quite big. This one's about six by six. Um, that one's very different. This one was one after I came back from Italy, and I think you, in these next group of paintings, you can see that that being in that kind of light really changed how I thought about color. It was a great experience to paint there. It was painful because it was so hot and the light was so intense but it, I really got a lot out of it. I'd always painted in you know, New York and Denmark and Connecticut where I grew up. The light is so shimmery, it's just reflected off the water, so it just sparkles everywhere and you never really get a black shadow, but in Italy it was you know, something else. But these, these paintings um, also reflect the time in my studio. I was in my studio in 14th Street was sort of winding down to an end and um, I was kind of being kicked out and there were internet people, it was right before the internet bubble, Inter internet people had rented out the studio above me and were using my roof as their terrace so they would stare down at me with their cell phones while I was painting and it was really awful. <laughs> it made me very tense and the painting started to um, reflect all this sort of agitation. And, um, but as I painted these I thought, I was very in interested in the masses of color and these intense, vibrant colors and the rich darks. And I often thought of these little, little moments as figural moments, but they never really, as though like maybe that little bit on the bottom might be a, a small crowd of people. Um, and then when I imagined that, everything in the, in the space would change. But they didn't get literally figurative, you know, they weren't obviously figurative. And these were two, this is a huge one. I did two huge ones, they were seven by 11. And they were really crazy. I sort of imagine myself as the figure in these paintings in a way that I was entering this space as I was painting them and they were really kind of, I was interacting with them in a kind of way. And these are small, this one's smaller. So I ended up moving my studio to Greenpoint um, and then decided to make some changes with what I was doing. I wanted to have more control over the paint, so I changed all my paint to one brand. So I was only painting with Old Holland. And that way I would really know I didn't have these random tubes. You know, I'd go out and buy two different tubes of ultramarine and you, you get a different mixture when you make the mixture. And I wanted it to be completely under my control, so I, I changed that. And I also started working smaller on squares and double squares. So see, these are some of the paintings that I did when I first moved. They still have that agitation, but they're starting to calm down a little bit, I think. I sort of imagine them as, you know, parts of cities sometimes, or um, I think things came in there from the World Trade Center and things came in there from Denmark and Italy and everything. That's another one. That's, this is 18 by 36. The other ones were like 30 by 30. And um, I started going out to Long Island and painting on Long Island, and that brought about another change in my work. Uh, I became very interested in painting just the, 
the light on the, the sky and the water and what was happening between the two things with the sun sometimes in there and sometimes not. I started a whole group of paintings that I painted there for three or four years. And um, these are some of those. They're quite small. This is, you know, 12 by 12. And some are 14 by 14. And so these are the Long Island paintings. But I still have some of those dots and dashes that I was so interested in. And that juncture between the sky and the sea was always very exciting to me and what was happening there. This is, um, I think it's like 20 inches high. That's another one. So when I was, came back to my studio after working in the summer, um, this, these are some of the paintings that I started working on. I was very influenced by, obviously, the horizontal bands that I was painting in the space in Long Island. And um, they're kind of working with these masses of color and subtle shifts of color. This one, though, ended up looking like, I think this looks like Denmark again. It looks like the fjord. And here's another one. <coughs> I was very excited to work with these bands of color and, and just imagine them shifting in the space. You can't quite see, but the top part of that is not white. It's sort of a pinkish color. But just sort of playing with where the horizon might be and how the color moved. And, if you imagine the horizon in one place, you saw the space in one way, and if you imagine it in another place, you saw the space in another way. This is another one. This is 36 by 36. And 36 by 36. Around this time is um, when I became pregnant, and I, I changed my palette. I stopped using, um, you know, cadmiums and leads and turpentine and everything like that. And it was actually a great thing because I had been, become so reliant upon this one palette with all these sort of really intense colors and then all of a sudden they were gone and I had to find new ways to make color. And it was very exciting. And I, I haven't gone back. I'm still using these palettes with lots of earth tones and browns and different earth greens and yellows. another one. This is 30 by 30. So these are done in the studio, but they're um, really connected to the landscape space. This is 36 by 36. They got kind of dark in the end, the last ones that I did were all very dark. This one's bigger. This is um, when I found out about the show in Florida, I decided to make some bigger paintings. They were all the biggest one I had done to that point was thir 36 by 36. And then so I tried to do some five by five ones. And so this is one of the five by five ones. This is 36 by 36. Again, it looks like Denmark, I think. It's four by four. And that's um, three by six. This is, again, done in the studio, but it's, a, it's really a tree, in, tree outside my aunt and uncle's house that my, my aunt photographed so many times, it's become this iconic tree for me. And um, it's so windy on that island of Morse that all the, all the bushes and shrubs and trees are, are kind of shaped like this, like that, to go with the wind. It always blows in the same direction. So this tree has this sort of beautiful slope to it. And this one is the last kind of big landscape painting that I made, and I called it Last Landscape. As this all came to an end, I felt more and more that I wanted to go back to the figure in some kind of a way in my work. Models, for me, weren't an option because I really didn't want anybody in my studio but myself. I poured through old notebooks and found a bunch of drawings in the museum 
from a museum of um, people fighting. This is one of them. Uh, I think this, I'm not really quite sure where this drawing actually came from because it just was in a pile of papers, you know, from years back. I'd done this drawing and I was really interested in it. And um, I'd been thinking about the figure and thinking about the figure and somehow this was exciting to me. So I did a bunch of drawings from the drawing, you know, tons of them. This is just a few snapped on my studio floor. Um, but from all these drawings, and there's more. Yeah. At the time, also, I was reading um, some Icelandic sagas. And there's one saga that I was really excited about, which was Eigil's saga. And Eigil was a, um, he was a poet, and he was also a terrible, frighteningly terrible warrior who did terrible things. And um, there's one scene in, in um, that just had in mind, this is also a time when you know, we were at war, we started going to war, so fighting and stuff was in my mind. But there's this one scene from the, um, the, the saga of Eigel where he, he's fighting this guy and he's about to lose, so he bites the guy in his neck and kills him. Um, and somehow that was something that really struck a chord with me, so I, I was thinking about it a lot and drawing these drawings. Um, and then this is a painting that came out of that. It lost the figure, um, the other figure. It didn't really work. Um, I didn't really want to paint a guy. I wanted to paint a woman. So somehow it didn't really bother me that I was painting you know, sort of Eigel's drama, but it was a woman. It, it didn't really matter. And um, one of the problems I had trying to resolve the painting was that um, I felt that I had to, to get a feeling of, the right feeling of tone, and um, it didn't have anything to do with the drawing or the ana anatomy or the fact that, you know, what the figures were doing, but it was something about how the, the painting came across when you looked at it. Um, so definitely not tonality, but more like an instrument, how the note is played and how you receive it. And this element stood aside from the image. It was very difficult to find that right tone. I just wanted it to be there as it was and not titillating or sentimental or melodramatic or kitschy or ironic or anything, but just there and, and unapologetic about it. So, um, so that problem with the painting from before came into the next painting and there's the two figures. And I kind of adapted, um, this, these two are, are um, what are they? They are 45 by 90. Um, and I took the, what I was doing in the landscape and the, the setting for the landscape and, and used that, but then brought the figures into it. That's another one. So that process that I showed you with the drawing was going on with all these paintings. And um, I would draw for a while and work out the figures and, and look at different things. I was looking at Rubens' Kermis painting in the Louvre, which is such a fantastic painting with these intertwining dancing figures that could be, they could be fighting or dancing, like sort of just so wrestling together in this wonderful way. Um, that's another one. This is, um, a little bit later. Um, I saw the Byzantine show at the Met and it had a huge impact on me and started another shift in my thinking. This is very, it's a funny way, it's very much like one of the um, Patnir sort of, the one that I showed you earlier of the figure crossing the river. Um, sort of St. Christopher, mother and child thing. Um, I. In the Byzantine show, I drew like crazy, so much that they, they were gonna kick me out of the museum or throw me in the Mets clinker that I imagine they had in the basement. Uh, you're not allowed to draw in the, in the museum in special exhibitions, which I think is like probably one of the most horrible things in the city. Um, and <laughs> especially when the show that is sort of touting that the, the Byzantine art was influencing all of Flemish art and showing Flemish art in the last room, but then artists weren't allowed to draw. On the paintings, which seems crazy to me. 
So this was another one, a painting that was inspired by that. And actually, the, the, the painting that I showed you, the third one from the beginning, you'll see it again later, started out as mother and child and then became father and child. But this is another figure painting. This started from a, um, a Sheila and a Gig image, which is a, taken from these Celtic um, sculptures that are found in, in um, churches in Ireland and England and France. And they're, they're sculptures of... Um, like a woman with a crazy look in her face opening up her vulva. And they're usually found in front of the doorways of the cathedrals because as they kind of destroyed their, their sort of heathen um, places, they used the same stones to build up the Christian places and then put these figures above the door because obviously it really meant a lot. Um, but in, in my picture, I drew a lot from the, these images and in my picture, it kind of became a birth image. I was very excited at this time, too, about um, how the figure was kind of found in the space and in relation to the landscape. So any time the head comes above the horizon or where the sea, it is very thought about in terms of the pressure. Like here, I, I imagine that, that the pressure of that, that line of land at the back of the sea is partially holding her up. If it wasn't there, she would fall back. You know, that it was that kind of compressed in the space. And, I was very excited to paint the human form and, and didn't really have any desire to get involved with clothing at that time. It was, you know, I hadn't painted the figure since I was in school, so I was so excited. <coughs> so forget about clothes, but it, it made it seem like um, they're very sort of my overly mythic maybe, but it didn't bother me at the time. I didn't care. I still don't care. Um, and this is a painting of a Tallinn man, and I don't know if you know about the Tallinn man, but he's this fantastic bog man that's in, um, there are lots of bog people found in Denmark and also in Ireland and Germany where there are bogs because the, um, they were sacrificed to some kind of earth goddess or something. And um, they have these ceremonial, they find ceremonial meals inside them and so on and so forth. And he was hanged and then thrown in the bog and he's in the museum in Hiltzilkeborg, and he's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. I've seen him several times, and I, I wanted to make a picture of him. So I kind of imagined the space that he might have been in, in the bog, but this isn't really the bog at all. It's just, and he's kind of in there in that earthy place. I'm sorry that the slide isn't very good. Um, but after I, I began this painting, I found out about Seamus Heaney's beautiful poems of the Tolan Man, and if anybody gets a chance to take a look at them, I think you should read them there. He wrote poems about Tolan Man and the Bog Queen, and several poems about these people. Um, there's something funny about this, too, is that when I was talking to my uncle about him, he said, oh, well, of course he's a Sorensen. And when you look at his face, you can see his face so beautifully. It's completely preserved, even the stubble on his face. And he does look like my father and my grandfather, Carl Sorensen, so perhaps there's some relation, I don't know. Um, so this is another drawing from Denmark. I, I went back to Denmark and did a bunch of um, drawings there, not painting this time, but mostly drawing and drawing the cliffs. I became very, very excited about the chalk cliffs and these massive forms. And this is one drawing that came into a painting. Um, I used it to make this painting here. But I had such a hard time getting that cliff to feel like this ma the massive form that I wanted it to be. Um, and so I decided, you know, I just, just struck a wall with that, and I had struck a wall with a painting that I was working on before this one. Um, and so I decided to do a bunch of large-scale ink drawings, because in Denmark, I really enjoyed doing these ink drawings in the space and I was very physical with the with the using the paper and the ink and rubbing into it and bringing the ink back into it and I really enjoyed that texture so I, I just to solve this problem I, I went and got huge rolls of drawing paper um, the kind that I was using to draw in, in the landscape with and um, decided to make a bunch of big figure drawings and I had all these rules about it I was not gonna ever decide what I was painting before I started. I was just, the drawing, drawing I guess you call it, the ink brush, 
big Sumi ink drawings. Um, I just would start by making random marks, drawing automatically, and then from those marks a figure would emerge and then something would happen and the, the important rule was that it had to all happen in one day. So um, I had to, once I found the image, I just had to kind of grab it and go with it and then just leave it and not try to fuss around with it. And that was the way I thought I would solve, one, the problem with texture that I was having, wanting to have this texture of the cliff that was just so textural in the painting. And then the other, that I was kind of flailing this terrible painting in my studio, which was driving me crazy. So <coughs> I needed the spontaneity. And so this is, I did, you know, like 10 of these huge things. This is one, another one of them, which ended up being somebody. And then there's another one. And some of these were shown in that show in Maine last summer. So these are 50, they're all 52 and a half inches high and they get kind of long. This is one of the longest one. It goes on for like 90 something inches and the other ones are a little bit shorter. But I, I really enjoyed making these massive figures. I think having the experience with the cliffs, the large cliffs and trying to draw it and then coming back into the studio, I kept wanting to make the figures bigger and bigger. and. Um, really feel the form and the texture. And so this is the painting that was torturing me all summer that I went back into and changed. It became this. And I was very excited about it at the time. I liked the gaze that the girl was having looking out and then her awkward gesture also kind of confronting me with that. It was very interesting. That's another one with the cliffs. These are cliffs from um, these white chalk cliffs on, Moor, on Moon, which is another island where my cousin lives. So this is, uh, the last painting was like 65 by 90 something, and this one is 60 by 80. So the figures are getting quite large. And this is another one, Esrom C. We play up kinds of funny games when you're working on a painting. Uh, this one was all about two different kinds of things, two different kinds of people doing two different kinds of things, one poking the sea and one poking the dock, two different kinds of leaves. The color was all split into different twos. But um, that's an exciting thing for me. And that's uh, um, the one that started out as a very Byzantine mother and child, but then became this, which was very different father and child. And it was in this time that I was just so excited about painting form, you know, this painting the back or painting the hand, it was just the greatest. This is 45 by 90. <coughs> this is another one, the boat. Again, I like to get the figures right up in the front and then have this tension in the space between inside and outside and then that oar kind of ripping through the space and sort of prying open that front space of the painting. Oh, this is, um, <laughs> this is a funny one. This is a drawing of um, when I was in Denmark and was visiting the Tala Man. There was a great show there of um, Ragnarok, which is the kind of where the gods are in, in um, Norse myths. And there's a lot about this one Norse god, which is Loka, who's a trickster god, who sometimes is helpful to the other gods and sometimes sort of tortures them. And one of the times when he tortures them, they bind him up and they, you know, the viper, you know, is constantly dripping poison into his mouth and his wife is constantly taking the poison away. So there are these wonderful images in that, of these sort of Viking images of bound up Loki. And I, I, I thought it was interesting, so I, I fixated on that for a while. And that's one of the drawings, and then I did a painting. Where he's kind of, he was bound and then he wasn't, but he sort of still is. And this is another painting of, um, it's called Cupping Marks, and the, because the stone in the front there is, um, this is a dolmen that's on moon, and in front of the dolmen there's a, another stone that was placed there much later, 
where people made these funny little cup marks in. I think that probably they were about every year, you know, at a certain time of the year, they probably were grinding into this cup to pray for something or a good harvest or who knows what that they were doing. And my cousin had a theory that two of the bigger holes, it must have been a hard winter or something that they had to pray extra hard. But it was a fantastic stone and um, it was exciting to paint. So that's this picture. This one is called Stones, too. It's um, from the stony beach on Moon. That's another one, the 45 by 90. That doll is called Naked Benji, so I titled the painting Naked Benji. Although Naked Benji isn't naked anymore. Now she has clothes on. But. It's another painting. This is um, 60 by 90. So I was really enjoying stretching that figure from top to bottom and just the pressure of her in that part of the space. This one's a fairy circle. She's making a um, fairy house. So that's her fairy house. And then um, that painting was the last figure one I did. And then um, Again, I, I felt like I wanted to draw. Actually, I think I was waiting for my canvas to arrive or something. I have a very small studio and it doesn't really allow me to stretch big canvases in. So I have to order them and sometimes there's a time lag. And so I started drawing again and um, I decided to bring gouache into the ink drawings and see what would happen. And it turned out to be really exciting. I really enjoyed it a lot. And, this completely different kind of thing. This girl digging. This is the first one that I did of this group with the gouache and ink. These are 52 by you know, 70 -ish in inches. And then that's the last one. When you consider that, I'm, uh, or when I consider that I'm painting um, pictures of children, it seems like a sort of very sweet thing, like Mary Cassad or something. But for me, it feels like a very exciting arena to be in because of all those dangers um, and the problem of getting the tone right. Graham always likes to say that you know painting the sunset is the most dangerous thing a painter can do, but I think also a mother painting her kids is probably one of the most dangerous things a painter can do. There's so many traps there, but. Um, uh, it's really exciting, and for me anyway, right now, um, it's. I feel like I've I've got to that goal that I had from years before, where I was trying to find a new way to paint the figure that meant something to me and was different. And um, and there it is. I'm using sort of elements from my life and trying to. Um, it's just what what artists do always, and and make some sense of it, make some, make an image that is meaningful. And all the parts are in there, the sort of the joy of the horror, the strength and hesitation and silence and noise as well. Sometimes when I'm painting though I feel as though I'm kind of working against a prevailing wind. I'm sure maybe many of you feel that way in this, this time and in this city. But I feel like I have to fight so hard to, to um, keep it from taking me away and away from my, my direction. I have to let the paintings stand for themselves and 
sort of bar all those fears from my studio door. If I feel like I've lent that fear in, the work is going to be tarnished by it and with inhibitions and feelings of is it too romantic, is it too old fashioned, retardataire. And if you get yourself caught up with all that nonsense, you're just another painting with that painter painting with that prevailing wind, which is not what I want to be. And you don't open yourself up to the beauty of the figure and the danger of the sunset and the body and of life in general. I'm going to show you my last painting, which is kind of different. I think that those drawing periods are transitional periods, so this is the last painting. It's not a figure, it's a horse <laughs> behind a fence. Um, so. That's it. Thank you.